Hello, everyone. I'm going to begin our program this evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight um, for this program with Jagdeep Reina. Um, just so you're aware, and anyone who may watch this afterwards, this event is also being simulcast live on YouTube on the museum's page. Um, hello, everyone, and my name is Tyler Blackwell, and I'm the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Associate Curator at the Black for Art Museum at the University of Houston. If you're unfamiliar with the museum, the Blaffer is a non-collecting contemporary art museum that was founded in 1973 on the campus of the University of Houston. It offers free admission to exhibitions, programs, and performances year round to all visitors. I hope that you all might consider joining us in person on Sunday, October 31st for the opening reception of a mid-career survey of the American artist and writer, Molly Zuckerman Hartung. Uh, the reception will be from 2 to 5 p.m. in person, so you can get your trick-or-treating in afterwards. And it will also feature a free concert by the San Antonio-based punk band Faya. Um, this evening, I'm extremely honored to welcome the artist Jagdeep Reina. And we're going to just have some images here uh, while I speak, uh, installation views of uh, Jagdeep's exhibition. Um, I've had the honor and deep pleasure of collaborating with Jagdeep over the last year on his current exhibition, Bonds, which is on view for just a few more days at the Blaffer through this Sunday, uh, to be precise. Our exhibition, which is Jagdeep's first solo museum exhibition in the United States, features over 25 works on paper, weavings, and animated films made over the last six years. I'm going to provide a short bio of Jagdeep um, and then turn it over to him uh, for those attending, please feel free to ask questions in the comment box or on YouTube um, throughout the presentation, and I will read them at the end for Jagdeep to respond to. Now for a short bio for Jagdeep. Jagdeep Reina, uh, who was born in Guelph, Ontario, received his MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2016. He has been the subject of solo and or two-person exhibitions at Javeri Contemporary Gallery in Mumbai, Soft Opening, London, Grice Bench, Los Angeles, Cooper Cole in Toronto, Midway Contemporary in Minneapolis, and the Art Gallery of Guelph. Reina's work has been also included in exhibitions at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, the RISD Museum of Art in Providence, and the Rubin Museum of Art in New York. In 2016, he was included in the 11th Shanghai Biennial. Um, and in 2020, he was the recipient of the prestigious Sobe Art Award in Canada. Earlier this year, Jagdeep was awarded a Mellon Foundation Arts and Practitioner Fellowship at the Yale University Center for the study of race, indigeneity, and transnational migration. Right now, excitingly, Jagdeep's solo exhibition, Chase, is on view at the Textile Museum in Toronto through March 2022. Jagdeep is also a current resident um, in the prestigious core residency program at the Museum of Fine Arts uh, right here in Houston. Um, and we are all eagerly uh, awaiting his arrival in Houston in the coming months. Um, everyone, please join me in welcoming Jagdeep Reina. Tyler, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm super excited to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but hopefully soon. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to uh, uh, do a, rem a reminder to myself and to everybody that uh, I'm speaking from Guelph, Ontario, which is on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe people, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, and Guelph today is still home to many First Nations people, Inuit and Métis people. Um, and this is a land in which um, I'm speaking from today too. Um, I'm excited to just do a quick uh, screen share and just quickly share everybody some ideas um, and currently where my practice is situated and the kind of the themes that I've been thinking about lately and how they all tie to my exhibition bonds at the Blaffer. Um, so let me just pull up my slideshow here. Just give me one second. Um, okay. All right. So 
Okay, so can everybody, I think, can see the screen. Um, yes, that works. Okay. Um, so I wanted to um, first just give a brief kind of introduction of my artist statement and kind of some of the ideas that I've been thinking about kind of expansively over the last five, six years um, and how there are themes both that are presented in um, the exhibition bonds and also kind of ideas that are constantly changing and, and moving over time. And so um, I just wanted to briefly share uh, kind of a rough sketch of my artist statement that I feel like was also really um, really helpful in helping build this conversation and relationship with with Tyler and with the Blaffer. But but to kind of put it up more simply, I think at the core of it, my work has always been interested in ideas of history mostly and really thinking a lot about um, history as something that's not fixed, but something that is constantly um, among us all the time and thinking about time as this kind of uh, concept of, of being cyclical um, or something as uh, one of the, one of the artists who I always look at, Chitra Ganesh, she says that time is something that's constantly like a spiral, always moving. And so I think thinking about this idea of time as something uh, that isn't linear has also allowed me to think about histories and specifically with my work, histories of communities in the global south, histories of migration, and thinking a lot about how histories of people, of communities coming from different different places across the world and how communities are formed and become scattered over time, how that also happens in the, in the context of, I guess, power or, or infrastructures of power. And so I think my work has always kind of aimed to kind of disrupt this idea of history being fixed or, or kind of the archive thinking about something as being fixed and instead dismantling that to think about heterogeneity. And so by examining like transnational migrations of history, and thinking about kind of archival research, I also kind of want to kind of dismantle power and think about history through lens in which maybe necessarily it hasn't always been seen before, whether that is class or, or race or gender or caste or geography, sexuality, whatever they may be. Um, so at the core, I think it it really is just about kind of this obsession with understanding that history and time aren't, aren't kind of concepts that are are linear, but are constantly moving, constantly spiraling, and 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 thinking about kind of the archive as something that isn't fixed, but is something that is living. Um, and I think those themes are are kind of what what we Tyler and I through our many conversations use to kind of build build our exhibition. Um, so my research, as as I mentioned, my art statement has always been quite um, my work has always been quite research based, and so. Um, currently, I think about my work almost as a series of projects too, or like a series of bodies of work in which I kind of think about ideas and histories and specific stories and, and kind of what I want to think about or share. And so something that I've been thinking a lot about is this concept of the Green Revolution, which has been um, at the forefront of my exhibition with Tyler. And so I think, you know, as I think about histories of migration, I also think about, you know, the kind of current time we're living in where we're thinking a lot about our, our impact on this planet and our environment. And I think a lot about how histories of migration is also tied to kind of histories of migration affected with kind of how there's also geographical migrations, how when communities are ruptured, what happens not only to um, to the lives and the stories that they take with them, but also the land and how the land is also ruptured. And so something specific I've been thinking a lot about is, is this concept of the Green Revolution, which in a nutshell, it was like a type of agricultural framework that was introduced to India in the 1960s as a way for um, farmers in northern India to start um, getting away, to stop kind of engaging in, in more traditional organic uh, ways of farming, but instead kind of forcing farmers to start thinking more about um, more corporate farming. And so in the 60s, kind of um, you know, high yield seed varieties and intensive irrigation and drainage and chemical fertilizers and pesticides, all of this stuff was gradually introduced to farmers to force them to kind of grow more fruit at a more rapid rate because the world was slowly starting to become more globalized. And this is also happening after, um, you know, India was decolonized from England, like many, many uh, countries across Asia and, and Africa that were kind of going through process of, processes of decolonization. And so this happened right after that. And and after like 40, 50 years of the Green Revolution, what had started happening was um, there slowly become a decline in, in water tables, widespread soil erosion, low forest cover, and an epidemic of farmer suicides. And so 
the the kind of the the traumas of the green revolution is now being played out really kind of and it's become um a cry of, of of the climate crisis and what's happening to farmers in india today and so a really close friend of mine satinder chohan wrote this beautiful play in the late 2000s called zameen and, and that word translates to land um and she lived with Punjabi farmers in, in the mid 2000s, interviewed them, sp spent time with them for like three or four months, um, recorded their stories and the struggles that they were going through and then took all this research and made this really beautiful play, wrote this really beautiful play. And about two and a half years ago, I visited her in London and um, she told me about this massive archive that she had built where she had hundreds of photographs and taped interviews and recordings. And she was like, you know, after I finished all this writing my play, I didn't really know what to do with this research. It's just been sitting in this kind of like archive that I have. And I told her about my practice and kind of my interest in, in history and my migration. And so we wrote, a, we wrote a micro grant together and I was able to kind of acquire her archive and I've been taking care of it. And through that archive, I've been studying it and thinking about um, ways to kind of reimagine these histories, whether it's through drawings or paintings or tapestries or poems or animated films. And so one of the pieces in the show is this tapestry called Chemical Cotton Flowers. So in, the, in this piece uh, that Tyler created and curated in our show at block for two women are their hands are kind of coming together and they're holding a, a piece of cotton that is no longer organically grown but grown uh with the with the kind of the devastation of impact uh, devastating impacts of chemicals and fertilizers and so at the bottom i wrote a small poem that says please strip them of these chemical cotton flowers let them cling to peace and you'll notice these kind of geometric um borders that I also have embroidered into these tapestries and this is called a fulkari. So a fulkari loosely literally translates to flower work so it's spelled p-h-u-l-k-a-r-i the first part of the word is full meaning flower and the last part is k-a-r-i work flower work and it was a um, the silk would come from Kashmir they would make these beautiful tapestries and here's an example of a fulkari and this is a type of fulkari that's called a bog which is the most um the bog is the most kind of um exquisite and the most regal type of fulkari that was done it was when the entire surface was covered with silk embroidery and bog translates to garden and so the literal translation of this piece this is a particular type of fulkari called jand bog jand meaning moon bog meaning garden and obviously full meaning flower, kadi, meaning work. So the whole tapestry is literally translated into uh, moon garden flower work. So this is a tapestry that is in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And I was, you know, as somebody who's was kind of formally trained in painting and drawing, and then the last four or five years, I've been sewing and weaving and embroidering and spinning, getting more and more into textiles. I became really obsessed with wanting to learn more about the full kadi. And I found out that, um, you know, when India was decolonized, not only did they kind of lead to the kind of the disaster of the Green Revolution, but it, you know, I think it was like 15 million people were displaced, over 2 million people lost their lives when India was torn into, in half and kind of made into two countries. And, you know, like there's millions and millions of people who have, whose families have lived through repercussions of the partition, including my own family. And so I was thinking a lot about, you know, what, what did the, the effect of the partition, what did it do, not only to the ways in which it destroyed like villages and, and people's livelihoods but how, how did it impact the arts and the crafts and so literally what happened with the Fulkadi that overnight this, this craft literally disappeared because you had women uh, living together <clears throat> growing uh, organic cotton spinning it weaving it with plants and vegetables and then embroidering it with these beautiful textiles and literally the craft disappeared overnight and you know also over time you know the state of Punjab was dramatically altered because of partition and then uh, many of these textiles simply just were destroyed and they simply just vanished and you know globalization has also kind of led to the breakdown of Punjabi villages and you know now you have like a lot of workplace exploitation happening and you have like you know machine made text uh, 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 looms entering and it's no, no longer done by hand so the craft is literally quite endangered now and this is a really uh, powerful photo that I was uh, spending time with when I was doing my research on, around the Fulkari that you see to a group of women who are fleeing uh, after India has been partitioned and you see in the back one of the women who has draped her herself with the Fulkari and I was so struck by that image seeing like oh wow like these textiles carry so much trauma but they also carry so much resilience. Um, this is a John Bong that it's also that's in my family home as well and this is from a film still that I was working on a small animated film that I also uh, I'll try to show at the end of my talk. 
<clears throat> Similarly to the Fulgari, I've also been really interested in the Kashmiri shawl. So, you know, Punjab and Kashmir, like many, many other regions around the world have gone through such devastating ruptures because of the effects of, you know, um, regions becoming decolonized and, you know, imperial policies where people are fighting over the land. And so Kashmir is one of those beautiful regions. It sits right on top of Punjab and it's where my family's from. And so Kashmir is one of those similar regions that has also radically changed so much uh, through just kind of uh, violent migrations and how these histories of migration alter these places. And so similar to the Fulkari, the Kashmiri shawl is also a really world famous, well-known, beautiful uh, textile that was woven with pashmina, which is like the rare wool that would come um, from the goats in Kashmir and then embroid <clears throat> embroidered with these beautiful, uh, woven and embroidered with these beautiful patterns of, of all types of flora and fauna and, you know, motifs and symbols, whether it's a like, you know, houseboats and people in Kashmir and the flowers and really, really beautifully intricate um, uh, shawls and became world renowned. And, you know, I became really kind of interested in thinking a lot about one of the famous parts of the Kashmiri shawl, which is called, which was the umbi was the tree of life. And it was an embroidered symbol, sometimes woven, sometimes embroidered. Um, and this design, you know, similarly to kind of how um, textiles was impacted by imperialism, the, the, the word umbi was later almost co-opted. It was co-opted by um, Europeans who were coming to Kashmir and kind of exploiting Kashmiri weavers and, and, and not just Europeans, but also uh, different empires across India. So, you know, the Afghan empire, the Sikh empire, you know, exploiting Kashmiri weavers. And, and later on that, the word umbi was stolen and taken from the Europeans and turned into what we now know as the Paisley. And so I was really thinking a lot about, you know, these histories. And um, when I was doing my research at um, the Yale Center for British Art, I came across this really beautiful painting from the 1700s um, of Kashmiri weavers uh, weaving um, the Kashmiri shawl at their looms. And you see Kashmiri women in their traditional fittings, um, you know, watching the weavers weave and, you know, the pots and the pans and the urns and, you know, kind of just the the liveliness and the tradition of, of what these crafts kind of meant to these communities and these villages. And the the, the famous Kashmiri shawl, Kani Hama, uh, is a village which is right beside my mom's village, Baramula and Ganihama. So these histories are really kind of all, also personal as well, like thinking a lot about my own kind of roots in this part of the region. This is a Kashmiri shawl that's in my family that's over 200 years old. It's one of our prized possessions and you can see the, you know, patterns of the uh, the Umbi, the Tree of Life. This is a pa uh, painting that I uh, uncovered when I was doing my research at the Real Center of British Art of the Pashmina goats. This was painted by a, a man named John, John something. He was um, spending time in India and he was creating these paintings and these paintings of the collection, collection of the Yale Center for British Art. Um, this is a tapestry that I did. Um, that's in uh, the exhibition that we curated, Tyler and I worked on. And this is called Garden Minorities. And in this piece, uh, this is from a photograph uh, that I had taken years and years ago when I went to Kashmir as a teenager and I, I rediscovered these old photos again. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, the Kashmir being the most uh, militarized region in the whole world um, and in undisputed disputed territory and obviously how that's affected the arts and crafts but also it's affected the livelihoods of the people and the garden being like as, as a, a site of, of, um, of destruction and of, of something that's meant to represent utopia but of a place that no longer uh, holds those values of community and of, of, of peace. And so I embroidered this tapestry and at the bottom I, I worked on another poem and this is called Sitting Quietly in the Shade of the Rotting Mughal Gardens where Srinagar, the city of Sun, quietly longs for them to come back home. And the, on the left is our two uh, Solzni, which is similar to Fulgadi, but Solzni comes from uh, a type of Kashmiri embroidery. And so I embroidered that into, into the border. This is a tapestry I did that's also in the show called Beautiful Weaver, and it's of a Kashmiri weaver at his loom. And I did the paisley or the umbi uh, embroidered uh, of, the, of the leaves. This is a uh, textile that's not in the Blackfriar exhibition, but it's currently up at the Textile Museum of Canada in Toronto. And this is a, a, a woven piece of fabric where I embroidered with silk, the shadows of the Pashmina goats. And so, you know, like there's a lot of current issues that's happening with the Kashmiri shawl production on you know, the, the 
effects of climate change, which is which is leading to the death of thousands of goats, driving up the price of yarn, and the pashmina is which is so rare now. The low pay being given to Kashmiri weavers, which has driven away their interest in the craft, and the market which is being flooded with cheap machine-made domestic substitutes. So similar to Fogati, you know, I'm examining kind of this form of art that is literally being decimated by by many many just um, external forces of climate change, of globalization, of, of the effects of imperialism. And I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can to, to learn these materials and these mediums as my own kind of humble attempt to, at, at preserving what I can as an artist to, and, and kind of keeping these traditions alive the best I can. I'm also really inspired by this work, um, which is by Emily Jassir. Um, she's a, an artist, um, a Palestinian artist who lives in Europe, has spent a lot of time in the US, uh, she actually was in Houston a few years ago, where she gave a lecture at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts Houston. But this piece is, has always been an inspiration to me. It's called Memorial to 418 Palestinian village, Villages, Destroyed, Depopulated, and Occupied by Israel in 1948. And in this piece, she sewed a large piece of fabric to re reassemble a refugee tent with 418 Palestinian village names embroidered on it. And I was so struck by this work, and I this work really kind of made me made me reconsider how I can try to engage with traumatic historical narratives when working with textiles in a way that's tender, in a way that's inviting, in a way that's soft um, and gentle. Um, that's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm so drawn to textiles is because it's it's a way for, for people to be invited in a warm and really delicate atmosphere and kind of sit, sit gently with kind of histories that are maybe troubling in a way in which people um, can kind of then kind of contemplate on them in a, in a in a productive, uh, productive way. Um, and I've also kind of been inspired by um, my animated films, which two of them are in the exhibition. One is called Olahor, which is, um, it was shot when I did a residency in Pakistan right before the pandemic happened in, in the uh, fall of 2019. And that was kind of my, my, I wrote a poem where I visited this Kashmiri gate and kind of this ancient, ancient uh, Kashmiri gate in the old city of Lahore. And I wrote that poem and I turned it into a stop motion animation with footage, with music. And I had a friend of mine who narrated, narrated the, the, the film for me. And I actually just found out that that film is gonna be, uh, was selected into the Los Angeles International Film Festival. So super excited and also grateful because Tyler has a really good eye. He, like, he knows, he was, he was like, he put that film in. And <laughs> so I'm really glad that it made its kind of debut at, at the Bluffer. And now it's gonna go on to be displayed at, um, at my first film festival. But I, I mentioned that film because I also want to talk about, you know, other artists who have inspired me. Um, this is the Black Audio Film Collective. Um, you know, John Acompra, who's uh, animated films. He really thinks about history. He thinks about the archive. He thinks about memory and, and, and communities of migration. And in his films, he kind of weaves, you know, poetry and music and archival footage and, and film and all kinds of interesting histories and, and almost creates like a tapestry of a, of a digital tapestry of, of his ideas. And so similarly to um, my textiles and my works on paper, I'm also thinking a lot about like sound design and of, of my animated films as like a, as an extension of my practice. Um, so th these are just some images of some ideas and like kind of where my work has been kind of moving. Um, and I'll just show some images now of, of some of my work. So I'm just gonna do another screen share and I will um, um, show some more images of some more work. And so, okay, so let me pull up um, this work. Okay, here we go. So these are um, images also in the exhibition. Um, and these are all works from, I think one of the things that I loved about uh, working with Tyler was he, he, he really inspired me to think kind of really expansively about my practice. And, you know, the work in the show uh, spans seven years. So from 2014, I think is the oldest work on paper all the way to 2021, which is new tapestries and new animated films. And so kind of to work in this really kind of intimate way and think, think a lot about the longevity uh, of, of a time, which may seem short, like in seven years, that is a short time, but even the longevity of seven years, how, how artists are constantly changing their ideas and, and you know their work is expanding, but how sometimes when so much you know you know as artists I don't think it's you know I think it's a good place for for us to be to not be married to our, to our ideas, but also never forget the origins of of what made us want to become artists. And so that was one of the the kind of the qualities that I really enjoyed um, working on 
with Tyler and the many conversations that we had. And so these are images of, of just works um, that kind of span kind of the early kind of origins of like what I was thinking about. And so I was thinking a lot about place of memory, thinking a lot about, you know, not so much kind of migrations and how it, if, what happened in the global South, but how communities were coming here and the types of homes that they were creating, you know, whether it was community centers and old or kind of abandoned um, brick buildings. And so this is a temple in my hometown that used to be a beer store. You know, this is um, early communities coming to Canada and America and, and the, you know, at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, you know, like I was, I had no idea that, for example, like, you know, East and South Asians were stripped of the right to vote. They weren't allowed to vote until 1947. And, and specifically in the context of Canada, that, that the vote wasn't given until India was decolonized. And so there is a kind of like that type of history too. Like what if India hadn't been decolonized say till the 1960s or 70s, would South Asians have been able to not get the right to vote until then? So I think a lot about how history isn't something that we're, uh, isn't fixed, but is constantly, we're constantly living with. And so this image, was a large scale work on paper that I'd done in 2015, I believe, where I was working on uh, the Vancouver Public Library in the city of Vancouver archives, collaborating with them, studying, you know, how these migrations of people from the global south, from South Asia, how, where, you know, where they were coming when they were first coming and the types of, you know, uh, types of struggles against, um, you know, um, racism or, or, or even um, struggles against, um, Ex exploitation, whether it was in the workplace or whether it was, um, you know, not even having the right to vote, what, what kind of struggles did they look like? And so this piece kind of emerged from that. You know, this is a piece I did um, about four years ago, where I, five years ago, where I went to London, um, England, and I, um, I started thinking a lot about how I think, you know, I think we're so, as people, we're so complicit in thinking about history through a really homogenous lens. And I think when we think about even our own history in a, in a homogenous lens and kind of develop this victim narrative, I think that kind of blocks us from thinking more expansively and, and, and not thinking a lot about nuance. And so I was also thinking a lot about, you know, how, you know, histories of communities in the global south, histories of migration, these aren't communities or histories that are fixed or not homogenous. Even within communities, there's a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of ruptures on, on sexuality, on, on gender, on class, on caste that exist. And so I did this really powerful um residency in the summer of 2016 where I did a lot of work at the South Hall Black Sisters which is this really kind of radical groundbreaking organization that was started in 1979 by a group of Afro-Caribbean and South Asian women who were coming together to kind of document um forms of uh resilience and of violence that they were experienced within their own communities within within communities of color and that really made me think about kind of not not kind of um, viewing history through kind of rose-colored glasses or, or viewing it through kind of a lens of, of kind of of the, of the mentality where someone is right and someone is always wrong because because like history and you know as people were were flawed and were, and were messy and so this work I feel really kind of proud of that it captured that moment in history and actually my screen here we ended up turning some of those paintings into these little postcards uh, so you can see some of them um, and we donated, uh, they turned, they they made these postcards and um, you can see their logo at the back and all the money was, all the money was raised for the organization, which um, benefited kind of all the grassroots work that they've done for the last 40 years. And so that was kind of exciting too, thinking a lot about my work outside of the institution, but also thinking about it kind of in a ways in collaborating with nonprofits or with other organizations and really thinking about kind of having an art practice that is quite expansive. And I think that's another one of the, my, the reasons why I was so excited about working with Tyler on this exhibition because I think you know what what drew me um you know when Tyler reached out and I said yes so immediately Houston has that spirit of 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 you know social practice of artists kind of having traditional painting practices or working in traditional mediums but also having like a really vibrant social practice too and so that's also something that I'm constantly thinking about in my own work too so I'm really grateful that this work on paper was also highlighted in our show with Tyler here's another one too um, a large scale diptych. Um, again, thinking a lot about, you know, ideas of home and, and of 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 home as something that isn't fixed, but constantly kind of living, uh, it, it kind of being uh, existing within two places, and um, hence kind of the idea of the diptych as well. Um, another piece too from the uh, from the exhibition done in two thousand eighteen, I believe, where I was going to. 
uh, um, the West Coast of Canada, which I think uh, not not unlike California, um, the West Coast of Canada also has a large and rich um, history of a lot of um, East and South Asian migrants, whether it was kind of working in the rail, building the railroads, or whether it was working the the mills and the factories. And um, there's one particular site in Abbotsford, British Columbia, which is about an hour and a half outside of Vancouver, where there's this old temple that's still standing there and it's like a national historic site now and it was you know built by um south asian settlers um in 1911 and the it's one of the only i think one out of three places in all of canada that is like a national heritage site that doesn't have that isn't tied to kind of a, um a, a european settler history but it's tied to um a settler history of a of a community that that on one hand are complicit in the role and their roles as settlers, but are also coming to these places as a result of colonialism. And so this work kind of really examines that and also examines, you know, um, structures around caste and around gender too. So, you know, I was doing a lot of re research around like, you know, South Asian women settlers and their role in kind of building community histories and how so often, um, you know, whether it was working class um south asian settlers or women settlers or, or settlers from different um caste backgrounds how those nar narratives nar narratives were kind of um disappeared and so and this piece i did a lot of research on this woman named mrs mohinder kaur who was kind of instrumental in building these communities and you know i i thought a lot about how kind of um yeah, I would almost kind of subvert this, the work on paper that I wanted to make, where I wanted to highlight her and the roles that she kind of contributed to building these communities. And so thinking a lot about kind of collage too. And I think when these types of works, some artists I'm always thinking about is, you know, someone like Carrie James Marshall, who's had a huge, huge impact on me um, with how he kind of thinks a lot about the, this idea of the memorial and kind of um, even within his paintings, elevating key figures in his paintings and kind of highlighting them to tell their stories. And that's a part of his work that's inspired me. Um, another work, Prob Femir Life, you know, thinking a lot about, you know, um, identities not being fixed, but as uh, um, living in kind of a place where, uh, you know, kind of the many, many um, masks that we wear, whether it is our race or our gender or identity or, or our sexuality or class or geographical place where those where we come from, how those can all kind of melt away. And so this piece, Prob Femur Life, um, seeks to kind of highlight that. Um, this one as well. Um, and then these are some new works, newer quilts. Um, this one is called Promise Me You'll Stay Beautiful. Uh, thinking also about kind of themes of feminist, of sexuality, of queerness. Um, this one as well. Um, and then I'll show like a few more images. Um, let me just pull them up here. Um, and so going back to the tapestry chemical cotton flowers that was in the exhibition, uh, I've also made a lot of other embroidered tapestries thinking a lot about um, the Green Revolution. And so this piece, uh, you can see the Fulgati borders at the bottom. Um, and one of the reasons why I think chemical cotton flowers is, is so important was that was one of the first ones I did. Um, where I also started highlighting uh, more of like my larger writing. And so before the the Green Revolution Tapestry series, I was only hi highlighting it in, cute, uh, in key places. And so this piece called Blood Money is, you know, a portrait of, uh, of uh, a Punjabi family holding a, a, a portrait of their son who has passed away from suicide by farmers going into so much massive debt. Um, this is one I did with another type of Fulgati. And this is a Fulgati pattern called the wheatgrass. And here you have just hands kind of cultivating the cotton, the chemical cotton, and this is tied to the piece in the Blafford exhibition called Chemical Cotton Flowers. This one is uh, called Delicate Grief of a hand holding a, a, a small photograph of someone who's passed away by suicide, um, and then the borders of the uh, Fulgati. This one is called um, Gorgeous Farmer, and is a farmer overlooking the land, and at the bottom you have traditional Fulgati embroidery. This one um, is called Let Me Taste Purple Silk Monsoons and Those Sticky Bithenda Fields. And it's about three Punjabi women uh, who have you know, now become widows and working in the fields of Punjab, cultivating and picking all uh, the cotton in the fields. Um, and at the bottom, I embroidered an old type of folkati called Senchi, which was used to be done in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century of Punjabi women, where they would uh, reimagine 
they would dream of the monsoons on the on a hot sticky summer day and then they would embroider peacocks in them so i added this border um to this tapestry and so i want to note that i learned folkari when i was in pakistan i was able to learn it from a, from a woman who lived there and i also learned it uh from my grandmother right before she passed away um this is another one i did of punjabi birds um thinking a lot about obviously the effects of the green revolution and what it's doing to not just you know soil erosion and um low forest cover and farmer suicides but also you know birds and just like you know the animals certain animals going extinct and all these punjabi birds that are going extinct and so this is a tapestry where i just did a lot of research learned a lot about different indian punjabi birds and birded their names in punjabi and then you can see the border uh, from the earlier, one of the first images I showed, which came from the Chandbag, the moon garden Fulkari that I uh, was learning. Another one, this one is called Listen Damn It. Um, here are the sprays being squirted, chemical uh, fumes, Punjabi, pesticide suicides. Uh, so you a Punjabi farmer spraying, being forced to spray his fields with pesticides. Another one of a Punjabi woman at a spinning wheel um, and a small Fulkari border at the bottom. This one is called There Are Corpses in the Rivers of Punjab and Fulkari Borders, where I just use blues just to kind of do like a uh, create a pattern of the rivers, the five rivers of Punjab. This one is called Don't Forget About the Corpses and it's a Punjabi uh, family. Um, and at the back, at the back, you have what was left behind kind of thinking about loss and of memory and, and you know, just kind of the crisis of the Green Revolution, how it's spiraling. And, and obviously, you know, India is going through the largest protest. Um, it's one of the largest protests in human history where over the last year and a half, uh, Punjabi farmers are, have been protesting against the new farm laws. Um, and so I feel, I feel like this work is so timely and it fits in so well with kind of the other works I've made, you know, um, how, you know, how di diaspora is being formed in the West and communities in the East, how they're constantly connected by these, these threads of history and memory that are kind of pulling these communities apart, but also keeping them, keep, keeping these bonds intact. And so I, I want these tapestries to, to be also um, pieces of resilience and, and of, of contemplation. contemplation. Um, and I guess I will kind of end um, with uh, a couple more um, images um, to show um, other textiles that I've done uh, from 2018, 2019, before I started working on these new series, just to kind of get an idea of, of how this craft has kind of been building over the last three, four years. Um, so these are just other other works on, uh, uh, on other tapestries that I've embroidered. Um, coming from the South of Black Sisters. This one is called Paradise Lost and it's of a garden in Kashmir. Uh, not, uh, not unlike the one called Garden Minorities, which is also in the exhibition. This one is called um, Fidan. It's of a Kashmiri woman wearing the traditional Kashmiri um, dress called the, uh, the Fidan, which you guys must have might have seen in the, one of the earlier slides I had showed of the that beautiful painting from the 1700s of the of the weavers and the women and, and the and the Fidan. And at the border, I did small, uh, the small embroidery of the Umbi, um, which, you know, is now called the Paisley. Um, I'll end my talk with um, two, uh, um, audio and video sound uh, works that I'm working on. So the first one is um, um, the rough cut of a, of a new uh, animated film I've been working on called Jandbog, which is about the moon garden. Um, so I will share that with you guys now. It's about two minutes.
the Minneapolis Institute of Art. They spread the cloth onto the black wooden surface, a garden glittering with 195 snow white moons embroidered onto the kadar, geometric gold, saffron triangles, blue diamonds, ancient Kashmiris extending their well-worn fingers across a century. The Nazar Bhattu says the silk does not lie, only God produces perfection. I promised myself I would feel grateful for Miss Flora Annie Steele strutting around colonial Punjabi villages. She wrote about women against heaps of golden grain. She claimed their fingers were patient and clumsy. She pointed at the roll of ruddy cloth that lay on their laps, their needles moving slowly through the qadr. And then she died. The ocean told us to leave them alone, to let them become as dark as the al mahira once owned by their mothers in West Punjab. The touch and smell of the wood, the carved floral designs filled with fulkaris made for their daughter's trousseaus. Only one was too precious to cut up. Um, I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jagdeep. Um, that was wonderful. Um, just to jump into some thoughts and questions, um, I wonder if you could speak a little briefly about um, the title of our exhibition, which is Bonds. Um, in the sort of context of, of what bonds means in, in concert with an exhibition like this, which as viewers um, hopefully can tell and, and maybe can tell from, our, from your presentation just now, contains images, um, multiple works that depict uh, scenes and places from sort of across the world, different reaches of the um, Punjab and Kashmiri diaspora. So we see scenes from, from Guelph, we see scenes from, uh, I'm trying to think if, if Toronto itself is in it or maybe, maybe just Guelph, um, as well as Vancouver. We see scenes from London, we see scenes from, the, from Punjab and Kashmir. Um, and obviously we also are connecting different, many different historical moments too, you know, some, uh, people and places that are very contemporary, um, and then as well as historical um, characters, figures, um, as well as even um, uh, your own sort of take on, on, on fairy tales is maybe not the right word, but sort of uh, uh, mythical um, scenes. And so there are lots of different um, points of intersection and, um, conjoinings of times and places. So could you speak a little bit of just about your, your thinking here? And, and you were the one that first brought the phrase bonds to the conversation. So um, would be, love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Tyler for that question. Um, I mean, I, I think about um, that word. I mean, I think the original thing I was thinking about was bonds of the world. And then I remember we had a really helpful exchange and I realized like, I think we, I think talking to you really kind of helped me realize that even like the word bonds can be enough to contain um, um, history in all of its kind of messy, expansive forms. And so, you know, I think bonds can also, I think there's uh, something really intimate and like tender about that word. I think it means, uh, you know, the bonds that we have with our loved ones, with strangers, with different places we've left behind, um, with the land that we're on, with the lands that we left behind, you know, it 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 it's kind of a a, 
a, a word that is almost like a chameleon. It kind of metaphor, it can, can, um, it can, it can kind of like it metamorphosize into many, many different categories. Um, and I think it, it's, it, it's kind of the perfect thing to think about um, an exhibition that also spans like six, seven years because it binds together, you know, many threads of, of my work and, and by binding it together, the word bonds kind of hold it in place. <laughs> and so uh, I think it's, I think it's a word that, you know, I try really hard to kind of approach with, um, with, tr I guess, holding myself accountable to think about history. <sighs> like when dealing with history, that is really, really overwhelming and, and really messy and has, you know, where so much has happened, but how to do that in a, in a very tender, in a soft way. Um, so I, 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 I'm really glad that, that like all of our conversations like kind of unfolded and, and we landed with that word. <laughs> uh, um, and then another question that has always, that has been, as I spent, have I, as I've spent time in our galleries too, I wonder about your use of color sort of across the board, um, but it is obviously sort of most um, apparent in, in the works on paper. Um, many of your earlier works, which some of which are included in the show, your earlier works on paper are rendered in black and white, but a lot of the works on paper in our show and in general, many of which are the result of your work um, researching in archives all over and then perhaps drawing from historical or very old photographs that are perhaps black and white or they're faded. Um, a lot of the a lot of the sort of resultant works on paper, um, whether or not the source may be black and white or faded, um, has you have then translated and rendered them in in a sort of technicolor, maybe often uh, even fantastically colorful way. Um, that to me has always sort of um, suggested a, a, an attempt to make or make make contemporary or 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 inject a sort of liveliness to them. Um, so I wonder if, if that is part of your thinking or if that is just something that has happened uh, organically. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's both a formal and a conceptual choice. Um, you know, I think working with archival materials um, in a really intimate way and then kind of pairing that archival materials with photographs I've been taking, um, as well as archival materials uh, that don't come from, um, you know, public or, or collections, but even come from like intimate sources too. And then also just kind of drawing from memory even to think about, you know, creating or drawing a scene in which um, the only thing that I really have to rely on is like my own memories and, and, and kind of encountering history or like doing oral history and kind of threading all of these things together. Um, those are kind of um, at the root of how I make my formal choices. And also, you know, artists that I've looked at, like there's so many artists who've inspired me. Um, you know, Luke Twyman's is somebody that I've really thought a lot about. Um, Mar Marlena Duma, um, and Jadeka Akiyuni Lee Crosby, a recent artist. Um, I guess recent in the sense that um, more contemporary to Luke and to Marlena, um, the way that she also kind of works with collage and uh, the paper transfers in her works on paper. Um, Mama Anderson, she's a painter from Stockholm, Sweden, who draws from um, from memory, from like her own mind, but also kind of sometimes looking at archival imagery, carriages, marshals, as I you know, was mentioning earlier as well. So it's just like a, 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 but also even historical too, is like sometimes I also look at like, you know, like Velasquez and like Las Meninas. And, you know, I had this kind of really turbulent love affair with Leonardo da Vinci over the summer. I was like, whoa, oh my God. Like, and so it's like, you know, color uh, comes with kind of uh, the history that I'm steeped in, which which is like an art history, but then also thinking conceptually about the choices I'm making when I am approaching archival material, but then when I'm also approaching history without an archive and I just have writing or I just have the animations I've been doing or I just have, um, you know, thread, cotton and embroidery and silk thread and what, what happens there. So it's a kind of a kaleidoscope of, of formal and conceptual choices that leads to my exploration with color. Yeah, and with mediums, I guess, too. <laughs> kind of sure. between video film and textiles and drawing and sound. And Right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read if we've gotten some great questions. Um, 
a question from our YouTube audience. Um, what is the role or significance of text in your work? And at what point did your practice, uh, did you begin including text? That's a great question. Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, writing was always, as, is always a big part, big part of my practice. My undergrad degree was actually, I did a major in English literature alongside my visual arts degree. Um, and then in grad school, I took a lot of um, seminars in, in writing. Um, uh, my second year, I took a uh, creative writing seminar. And in my first year, I also took, I worked at the writing center. So writing has always just been a big part of my, my practice. And, um, and then throughout the last two years, I always take um, writing classes, like 10 week writing classes, um, whether it's poetry or, or songwriting or um, fiction. And so writing is just something that I love. Um, I, I think about it um, as like a material, as like a medium, as like an extension of textiles, of drawing, of painting, of video and film and animation. And so text has always been there. It's always been in the work. Even my like earlier drawings from an undergrad, there would be text, like there'd be text on my works in, gra in, in, in graduate school. Some of the, there's text in many, many of the older works on paper that are in the show. You know, the one of the women at SBS, there's a lot of text written in, in the blue at the top. There's text and the one of, of uh of the of, of the men trying to fight getting getting the right to vote there's texts and poems and the tapestries and then the animated films that are that are also screening the two animated films oh lahore and gorgeous farmer both of those films uh are their script was written by myself and so i would write the scripts um work with a, a writing uh um a writing mentor uh work on getting edited and then i would send it to uh you know um like all the horror was narrated by my friend Selena, and then Gorgeous Farmer was narrated by myself, and then I those are kind of uh, scripts that have turned into long texts that I now use as like yeah use the scripts for my animated films too. So writing is always there. I I, I don't really see it as um, I think like I don't really see my work as like um, valuing one medium over the other. I try to not think about my work through like a hierarchical lens. Like I think drawing and painting is equally as important as textiles, it's just equally important as video and film, it's equally as important as animation, equally important as I'm um, learning sound design, equally as important as my writing. So it's all it's all there. So text is kind of just a, a, a kaleidoscope of, of my practice. And that's another reason why I also wanted to show that black and white photograph of, of John Akamfra of the Black Audio Film Collective, because they're also an artist collective that have hugely inspired me, because they've made me think a lot about text um, and writing in their work as just, um, as just part of their uh, part of uh, establishing an interdisciplinary practice, which is something that I'm I'm trying to do. Yeah. So text is 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 equally as important as every other medium in my practice, and it's always been always been in, in my work for many years now. Thank you. Um, Catherine asks: the materiality in your drawings and textile work contrasts to source materials. This is similar to my question. Source materials of archival photographs. Um, is this connected to ideas of history and memory being in flux? Yes. <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, for sure. Um, Stephen asks, uh, there is both a meticulous labor intensive quality to the way you depict images, whether embroidered or drawn, um, as well as a snapshot, almost casual quality um, to images that carry a great deal of political significance. How do you choose your images and how you will represent them? Yeah, um, I ch choose my images based on like um, my having a research based practice. And so, you know, in the talk, this kind of the first portion of the talk, which is just research images, that was kind of highlighting different moments, points of research that I'm interested in. And then studying research and like doing oral history interviews, finding the, uh, you know, archival uh, materials in which that research is housed. And then um, from that creating my work and that's always been a part of my practice. And so uh, the choice is just, um, I make that choice uh, uh, by kind of, I guess this kind of uh, obsession I have with history with like kind of this, this curious nature I have of like understanding what, I, what it is that I wanna focus on and so, um, each work in the show um, is a part of like a lot of hours and hours and hours that I've uh, I've kind of nerdily put into um, that specific body of research that I'm doing. And so, um, you know, um, whether it's a drawing of the, the blue drawing, uh, the work on paper, 
um, <clears throat> of the woman at SPS, which um, that work is at the Blaffer, but it was also turned into a, a postcard, right? And so it's like, it's like you have each like each work that I that I make in collaboration with an archive uh, develops in, in a large body of work. And I think one of the reasons why I was really excited by working with you, Tyler, and with with having the show at the Blaffer is because I feel like the Blaffer doesn't focus on like one specific body of research that I've done. It's more kind of expansive, more almost dreamlike quality of how I approach my practice, which is always thinking about history. And so every image that I work with um, is really kind of meticulously um, researched um, and comes from a, from an archive in which I've collaborated with that archive. Sometimes it's it's like an institution, whether it's like the city of Vancouver or a non-for-profit organization. Other times it's uh, like a friend, like my friend Susanna, who just happened to build this like massive personal collection of of research she did around Punjabi farmers, and I just uh, I was able to work on uh, build a grant, uh, write a grant, and collaborate with her to to work with her archive. So it it kind of spans. Uh, I think similarly to my my material, I don't think about my research in hierarchical hierarchical lens. You know, uh, an, a prestigious library or museum their archives like the Minneapolis Institute or you know the Vancouver Public Library or is equally as important as a non-for-profit archive or as an archive coming from uh you know someone in the community who I've interviewed or coming from a, a friend like it all they're all equally important yeah yeah and I mean I imagine um I think maybe part of part of Stephen's question too is thinking about because there obviously are certain works of yours that um that are sort of um, our moments of action are again, the sort of historical frames, which then speak to this larger history of transnational migration and, and often oppression, right? And so they, they, a lot of the works are imbued inherently just with this sort of um, uh, political, political, uh, if not outright language, thinking of like no turbans allowed, for example. Um, or, or it is the image of the men in, in the basement of the temple, um, which was a community center, of course, that was a sort of secret, not so secret meeting place to sort of talk about the advancement of voting rights and, and um, civil rights in general for, for Sikh and South Asian immigrants, right? So, so how, I think maybe, as you're like looking through these archives, as you're sifting through, as you're researching, do you find that you are drawn to images that then, I mean, is it sort of a, a snap um, moment of, of awareness and cognizance that happens on your end of sort of being like, this is this is meaningful and this, be, this becomes part of a story that I feel I wanna tell? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's like, it's a bit of both. It's like a kind of, um me becoming kind of aware of um, a particular moment in history that happened that I wasn't, I had no idea about and kind of kind of unpacking my own um, lack of, of awareness. Like, you know, for example, growing up uh, in Canada, like I had no idea about, you know, any of like East or South Asian or indigenous histories or black Canadian history, you just don't learn about it. Like history is so kind of homogenous. And so learning about all this stuff and, you know, you know, violence and like, you know, the anti-Asian riots and, you know, voter dis disfranchisement and, you know, all the stuff I was like, whoa, what? And so when I think about that particular work on paper, like of the, the men that reading the basement and, and trying to, and to uh, actively fight for the right to vote, that, you know, that was something that I, I came across when I started learning, wanting to hold myself accountable to learn more about kind of uh, histories of um, South Asian diasporic formations in, in Canada. But then it would also come from like, uh, you know, librarians or mentors who would be like, you know, you deep, like read this book or, or you should know about this or you should know about that or, or go visit this archive or, or go here or, or, or write to this person. And so kind of it's become this kind of hybrid exchange. And, you know, I even think about my, my the fellowship at Yale, like I, you know, I had no idea about those paintings that existed from the 1700s of Kashmir weavers. I had no, no idea about, um, you know, how the, you know, the, the legacies of colonialism, imperialism on the Kashmir Shah, like I had no idea about. I didn't, the other photo I showed of the two women, uh, when partition happened and the woman at the back is holding a Fulkadi, like I didn't know. And so it's it's kind of, I think choosing my images comes from that place of kind of holding myself accountable um, and then finding the right medium that would work best to kind of translate it. And then also uh, that accountability comes from kind of uh, my obsession with research and then also having conversations with 
with colleagues, with librarians, with curators, with activists, um, with academics, um, um, and finding the right sources and right places to go and, and, and where to find research. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, Ikra asks, uh, what have your experiences as a South Asian artist been in art museum spaces, thinking about the role of art museums to their uh, communities? What do you think art museums owe them? Uh, I think that's a, I mean, that's a heavy question and a really important question. And I, um, I, I thank you, Ikra, for that question. Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like, um, you know, I think museums are a really, are really loaded places and, and really charged places. And there's a lot of, I think there's, I think we're living in a time where, where um, you know, museums are really kind of grappling with, um, you know, certain museums are grappling with their histories, with their role and how, where their collections came from and how they were built. And I think all of that kind of um, taking a look at the mirror and kind of understanding how a collection is built. And, and I think all of those questions are, are really important. Um, I mean, I think museums, like any other place, I think they're complicated. I think they're complicated spaces. And I think there's, there's a lot of wonderful things that happen within them. And there's a lot of room for improvement that happened within them. I think, you know, you know, museums are kind of, are many museums are reaching this incredibly exciting crossroads where, um, you know, you know, they're going to change because, you know, so much has changed and, and conversations around museums are changing and, and how artists approaching museums are changing. And, and I think, I think the museum is just going to be constantly evolving. Um, you know, there's sometimes you hear, like, I remember reading funny memes, like the museum industrial complex, and I mean, or, or even hearing about, uh, you know, the, for example, like, you know, the British Museum in London, which so much of the, their collection has come from, um, you know, f uh, from pillaging other places in the global south, but then you also have really radical museums, you have like the underground museum in LA, what Noah Davis did, he, you know, he created a free museum for, um, uh, to serve his community, which is a working class, um, low income, um, black and Latinx neighborhood, or you have, um, you know, uh, the Textile Museum of Canada, which is a non profit museum that exists to collect uh, uh, fiber based work, or you have the, I went to this, the Third Ward Museum in New Orleans, which is beautiful, and it was like in a small house, and I walked in and it was like memorializing what happened during Hurricane Katrina by the people who lived through it, not by kind of how it was told in the media. And so you also have like really beautiful, inspiring museums serving as kind of oasis and, and a place for community to find a way to, to rest and to, to think uh, critically about how to become better people. And so, you know, my specific role as a South Asian artist in a museum, I think, um, you know, I've had good experiences and I've had experiences that have also kind of maybe um, in hindsight, um, could have been better too and but I think that's normal I think we all have those experiences you know I don't think my experience is necessarily special um and so I think that being said I think the museum the the model of a museum is is going through so is evolving so much and I think it's I think I actually think it's a really exciting time for us as community members to have museums because um because they are doing some really great work and in, in the area in which they need improvement. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of potential for museums to improve too. And similarly, artists, I think how we can approach museums can also become more expansive and more, you know, dream more bigger um, when we think about, it. like I think about Emily Jasir's piece when she was invited to have her show at the Guggenheim Museum. She literally turned it into this space where people would come in and they would embroider her onto the tent that she had sewed. And then she would give them tea and there would be there would be traditional biscuits and cookies and food from from Palestine and people would cook together and like it turned into like a like as if you were going to someone's house and that was happening at the Guggenheim Museum. So so yeah, so I think museum is it's an exciting time for museums and for artists to kind of continue to come together and, and create um really wonderful hybrid experiences for for people to to leave uh having changed and just becoming better people yeah that's my utopian answer <laughs> i agree and we appreciate utopian answers um so uh, we have if you have if anyone else has any other questions i we have one more great question here 
Um, I love that you work so deeply in research and archives to inform your work. Do you believe that arts and crafts can serve as valuable archives uh, themselves to a certain extent as well? Yeah, it's a great question, Aaron. I mean, I think about, for example, going to the Minneapolis Institute and seeing that beautiful, their collection of Bulgatis. And I'd never seen uh, so many beautiful bogs like that. And like that was, you know, they were coming out of their, their, their storage room, which was the textiles. So it was coming out of this big, like, um, like silver, like, you know, metal box and they're pulling them out. And it was like a, it was, you know, an archival storage space in their museum of textiles. And I was studying and looking at these beautiful textiles. And then I, you know, six months later, I went to Pakistan and I got to learn that embroidery technique. technique and I learned, asked my grandmother to teach me, to teach me more of the embroidery too. So, so yeah, so that was an example of the Minneapolis, and similar to the Royal Ontario Museum, I also visited their museum, their collection. Um, I know the Victorian Albert Museum has an incredible collection of Fulgatis. I know the, the Metropolitan Museum in New York has an amazing collection of Kashmiri shawls. I'm sure, I'm sure the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston must have some incredible textiles too. And so, so yeah, so I 100% believe that the arts and crafts serve as valuable archives in a museum collection because, you know, that's what they're there for. You know, if you email any museum curator and you ask them, you want to set up an appointment to see a specific textile, they have it in there. It's their job for them to bring it out and show you. And so when you see something, like seeing a, a, a bog or a Kashmiri shawl in a photograph is not the same thing as seeing it in real life. It's just completely 180. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to own a Fulgati, a bog and a Kashmiri shawl in my own family home. But, but you know, I'm also lucky enough to, to, to take advantage of the museum and see their incredible collection because I just have one and it's like so old and it's like wrapped in our closet and we rarely take it out now. And so it's, it's hard to really engage with because it's so old. But in a museum, you know, they have the right infrastructure, they have lights and they have the proper equipment to, to show textiles or show, it could be anything, it could be stone carvings, it could be ceramics, it could be pottery. Um, so the museum, you know, it's their job to, um, to not just uh, teach artists, but anybody interested in, in learning how the arts and crafts are, are valuable archives because they can help us understand how to engage with, with history and another medium that isn't maybe a painting or a photograph or a film or, or, or like a, a, a written work. Certainly. Um, well, Jagdeep, we are look, so looking forward to your arrival here so you can, I'm sure, spend some time digging through the collections of the MFAH here and also just have you close by as you are spending time thinking and making um, during the rest of the core residency. Um, but in the meantime, thank you again so much for your time this evening, and um, we're really grateful to hear directly from you at the conclusion of, of our exhibition at the Blaffer. It's been a privilege, and, and I know that our audiences are better for it, so thank you so much again. Um, and thank you to everyone else, too, for watching this evening. Um, and please come and see our exhibition, which ends... Uh, like I mentioned, this coming Sunday. So just a few more days to see it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Tyler. It was so fun to work on this with you. Likewise. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.